Good morning. We're glad that you're here, if you're here. And if you're not here, we're, we hope that you're listening in. And um, uh, we praise the Lord for each one of you. It's been kind of a long week, hasn't it? With all the news about the virus and everything that's going on and um, all the new cases. But we can praise the Lord that he's in control and that he reigns. Amen? Well, I think we need to remember to keep in prayer those who are who can't be here and who are sick. And uh, uh, Phyllis and Rick are out of town today, but uh, Dale and Sherry would not be able to make it, and uh, Todd and Terry and Steve and Roxana and uh, Dale, Diana and Mercedes and others. We just pray that the Lord would be with them and bless them and that he would comfort them where they're at. Today's sermon is entitled, Peace in the Storm. And um, uh, it's found, the scripture verse, the main scripture verse that we'll be speaking from, Mark, is found in Mark 46, Mark 4, 36 to 41, and John 20, verses 19 to 23. And we'll also um, uh, look at some other verses later, another story in the Bible. But, um, uh, We've all been going through the storm lately, haven't we? Have you ever noticed how the storms of life come on us with little or no warning? I mean, just think, in February, everything was wonderful. The economy was wonderful. There was no coronavirus. And everything was smooth and sailing along smooth. And now we're in the storm. You can be there one day and the next day you're in the storm, you're living your life, going to work, and the children are in school, which that hasn't happened for a while. Life is as it should be, not always great, but relatively peaceful. My sermon today has a lot to do with peace. Then without notice, the storms blow in and there's chaos. And the storms of life don't have to be weather related, usually they're not. There's a multitude of storms that blow into our lives without warning. Employment storms, or you could call that financial storms. There's health storms that without notice blow into your life and threaten you with sickness. Sometimes it's even life-threatening illness. There are relationship storms, legal storms. And sometimes these storms gang up on us and hit more than one at a time. Like lately, we've had the Kenora virus and then we've had the unrest, the civil unrest that we've experienced. And it makes things difficult. It can make things tough. And it can challenge our faith. But I believe that one of the things that we take for granted, most of all, that God gives us is peace. Peace. There's peace. We can have peace in the storm. It's nice to be living in the calm before the storm, isn't it? Everything's going good. There's really no problems. We have calm. Most of the time, I think we take this peace for granted. If we have it, we really don't think about it. And once the storm is over and peace returns, we forget that it was ever gone. As long as things are going okay, that it's okay. When was the last time you looked up into heaven or bow at your bed or whatever and thank God for the peace that we live in most of the time. Most of the time, we have peace as Christians. Here lately, we've been going through the virus and, and our church has been so lucky. We, I don't think we've had anyone in our church that's come down with it. We've had people that we know that's come down with it and we've had people who thought they had it, but then they taste, tested negative. I think we need to remember to thank God for the great life that we have and for the freedom that we experience. And I'll talk more about freedom next week. That'll be my 4th of July sermon. I think every day we should stand or kneel or whatever and thank God for our loved ones who are near to us. 
and for the many blessings of life. We need to remember that in the storm. We need to remember to thank God for the goodness that he has always given us. I believe Christ's disciples were probably just like us. I believe they took Jesus' peace for granted. Think about it. Jesus took care of all their needs. They didn't really have to do anything. If, if they didn't have food, Jesus would create it or extend what they had until it fed the multitudes. He protected them. They really were living the good life in the calm before the storm when they were with Jesus. But in Mark 4, verses 36 through 41, we find Jesus and his disciples in a boat crossing the Sea of Galilee. Let's read it together, starting at verse 35 through verse 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat there were also other boats with him. A furry squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on occasion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. In the King James Version, it reads, Peace, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The disciples find themselves in a sudden storm that was threatening their lives. We're told that the wind battered their boats and that the waves and the sea had filled them. The storm had stolen their peace, as storms usually do. Everything was fine an hour ago, but now they face death. But when you know Jesus, you know the one who controls the storms of life. Look at verse 39, and, he, and it says, he, Jesus arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Jesus spoke peace into their situation. I want you to know that no matter what your situation is, Jesus can speak peace and calm into it. If we look at our story, it tells us the disciples feared the storm. They feared death, but even in the face of certain death, Jesus was able to bring peace and calm to their storm. Those who have Jesus have peace. Sometimes we may lose sight of it, but it's always available to us. The peace of God is always available to those who believe and trust in him. Of course, obedience has a little bit to do with it. If you're going through the trials and tribulations today, Jesus is still able to calm the storms of life. If you're burdened down in the darkness and you can't see a way out, pray and ask Jesus. He can still speak peace into your storm. If your back is against the wall and you're ready to call it quits, just ask Jesus to take control of your boat. Because that's what this story is really about. Letting Jesus have control. You will never experience the peace that surpasses understanding until Jesus is in control of the boat. You understand where I'm coming from? Jesus is still in the business of calming the storms of life. This is not the only time you find the disciples living in fear. In John 20, 19 to 23, it says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They, they recognize this is the real deal. This is the real McCoy. He's got the nail prints and he's got the spear in his side. He, you can see the wound where he had a spear in his side. And they rejoiced. Their peace was back. Their peace was, to them, it was a visual sign. When, when Jesus was there, they knew everything was all right. But I want you to know we can't see Jesus. I don't know about you. I've never seen Jesus. I've talked to people who said they had. And I don't know, you know, I'm not going to call them a liar. They, they were 
well, at least one of them was a wonderful Christian man who was far, and I knew him a long time, and I don't think he ever lied once. But he said Jesus appeared to him. Again, Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Again, Jesus says, peace be with you. Peace is a wonderful thing. We, without life, it's not the same. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. He gave the disciples an awesome responsibility, but he gave them the power of the Holy Spirit to administer it justly. In our text, we find our disciples, the disciples of Christ huddled behind closed doors, hiding in fear. You see, the Jews hated the Romans, but not as much as they hated Jesus. And the Jews had used the Roman law and the Romans to do their dirty work for them, and they crucified Christ. They both hated Jesus, the Romans and the Jews, because they perceived that he threatened their leadership. They wanted to be in control. Today, we see that in politics. How dirty of a business is it <laughs> that all they do is call each other liars and names? I personally would like to see a candidate come along and say, this is what I want to do in the next four years. Have you, have you noticed that? And I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go down the rabbit trail too far, but you, have you noticed there are two candidates? They're not saying anything about what they're going to do. They're only talking about what the other people have done. And it's all about what they've done wrong. The disciples feared for their lives and they knew that the Roman authorities could crucify Christ, then they could come for them too. It was a reasonable fear. I think if we would have been there, we would have been in fear. Christ had been crucified and buried and after the crucifixion, the Bible informs us that the disciples went into hiding. They were afraid. They knew that if the Romans could kill Jesus, <laughs> that they could kill them too. <laughs> I mean, if you could kill Christ, then you can kill me. The record says that they were assembled behind the locked doors, but that was the moment that Jesus decided to show up. Jesus is never too late. Many times he comes just in the nick of time, but he is never too late. I want you to know that over the years that I followed Jesus, and I know that you would agree with me, I've never experienced a situation in my life or in the life of others where Jesus showed up too late for the situation. Sometimes we think he's too late, but then later on, if we look back, we'll see Jesus was right on time. Have you been there? You're in the midst of the storm and the lightning's flashing and the thunder's rolling and you feel like that your boat's about to go down any minute. And Jesus appears with the words of comfort. He commands the storms to be still. Have you ever wondered why Jesus waits until the last minute? I mean, there's more than one reason. But I was thinking about it as I was writing this sermon. Why does Jesus wait to the last minute so often? And it occurred to me that maybe the reason Jesus waits to the last minute so often is because he really doesn't wait to the last minute, but it's not until we're threatened with death or severe bodily harm or financial failure or health failure that we actually start listening and saying, yes, Jesus, you can take control now. You know, Jesus comes to us in our services all the time. How many of you have heard Jesus speak to your heart in Sunday school or in church or maybe through a sermon on the radio or on TV or have your mom and dad or your grandparents told you Jesus is the answer? And you say, well, I really don't have time for Jesus right now. I'm making too much money and, you know, we have a lot of people hopefully listening on the Internet, so I'm not just talking to you all, but there's a lot of people who are not just ready to say, Jesus, I'll give you control. 
Things are going too good. I'm living life. I want to experience life before I give you control. Because they're afraid that Jesus is going to take all the fun out of life. And we know, I know, my witness is, is that life is a thousand times better since I've trusted Jesus. He, he didn't take the fun out of my life. He put the joy into it. And now I can joy in everything. Even in the storm, there is joy for the ones who trust Christ. Jesus can bring peace in the midst of any storm. In fact, Paul says it like this in Philippians 4, 7, that Jesus gives us the peace of God which transcends all understanding. And it will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul says that this peace is so incredible that there's no way we can understand it. All we can do is experience it. The peace of God does four things in our lives. First, it guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. When the winds blow and the thunders rock your world, you can have peace in the storm because Jesus is on guard. Jesus is the great peacekeeper, peacemaker, the peacekeeper. And one day he will bring permanent and absolute peace to our lives. But until then, he says, trust me. Jesus has always been there for us. We have no reason to doubt his word. Second, his peace fills you. Right now, we need the spirit of the living God to fill us with power and love and the spirit of a sound mind. You know, one of the greatest things that affects America is this mindset that we're all divided and against each other. Amen? We are fighting, you know, the, the blacks and the whites can't get along, and men and women can't get along, and children and their parents can't get along, and the Democrats and the Republicans can't get along, and the conservatives and the liberals can't get along, and plus, we can't get along with any of the other nations, and they can't get along with us. The, Satan has sent us a message that the world is divided and you can't trust anybody. And that's exactly the message that Jesus fought against. Jesus says, I want you to experience my love. I want you to have my unity. If you are in me, then I am in you and we're all in God together. We need unity in the world. We need the spirit of a sound mind. But we can't have sound mind in the world because there's so many people who don't know the Word of God. I want you to know that you can only have a sound mind when you live by God's laws. Whether you live them because God put them into existence or because they're the laws of our land. The laws of our land come from God. He, what is it? What's one of our laws that you can't commit murder? What does it say in the Bible? Thou shalt not kill. What's the other law that you can't steal? What does it say in the Bible? Thou shalt not steal. All of our laws come directly from the Ten Commandments. And some of them have expanded from there. But unless we trust and know the Word of God and beyond the shall nots to the we should do's, because the shell lots are really for the people who don't know God. They don't know his peace yet. They've not surrendered and given Jesus control. And the will do's are for the people who said, Jesus, I'll follow you no matter where you lead. I'll do what you say. The, the, the have nots that you can't lose anymore, they're behind us. We've already made up our mind. We're going to follow Jesus. Now all we got to do is make up our mind and stay on track, have a sound mind and a sound spirit within us, and follow Jesus. But that's hard to do when, you're, when you don't know the Word of God. So many people are filled with hate and anger right now. We're a divided nation, and as long as we focus on what divides us, we will never experience the true peace that Jesus wants us to have. Jesus wants to fill us with his love and unity. Not only does he want to fill us, but third, he wants to give us life. By the love of we need to be revived. We need to be made alive again. Not just us, but our nation as a whole. When I think, you know, I've been working on the 4th of July sermon, it's, it's really done. It's just waiting its turn for the 4th. Uh, when I think about the freedoms that we have and the nation that we were 
and where you've come to, it's really sad. 16 years ago, I gave my first sermon as a Nazarene, and it was really my real first sermon ever. My pastor, Mel Justice, had come to me, and he said, I want you to speak on the 4th of July. And I had never spoken in that church before. I had just received my local license at the district assembly. I felt called. And uh, he came to me and said, I want you to speak on the 4th of July. I think he probably knew, being an ex-Marine, I might give a thrilling expose on freedom and America. And, uh, and I think I did. Uh, that's my opinion. There were many there who congratulated me, but that's not the point. The point is that that 4th of July, when I looked at America, I saw the land that loved God. And since then, we have slid so far that I can't preach that sermon anymore. It's true that God has blessed us and that we're one nation under God, but really we're so divided that can we really call ourselves a nation under God? God wants to fill us with life. We need Jesus to breathe on us again the spirit of truth so we can overcome the deceptions of Satan. See, we really focus on other people, colors and sexes and nationalities and all those things that we think those are the enemy. Those are the ones who are against us. And really, we all want the same thing. We want to bring our children up in a loving, safe, healthy environment. We want to worship our God our way, whether we feel their way is the wrong way or they feel our way is the, the wrong way. We have that right in this nation. But we're so divided against each other, and it's the lies of Satan. Satan is our enemy, not the other people. They want the exact same things we want, maybe in a different way, but they really want to live in peace with their families. We need Jesus to breathe on us again. We need revival in every city in America. Amen? We need God to come and revive America. There is so much going on in our world, from the coronavirus to craziness in the streets. We need God to give us a new start so that we can experience his peace once again. I don't know about you, but over the last 12 weeks, I've felt my peace threatened. I look at the world, I look at the nation, and I see what could be coming down the pipe, and I think we could be losing a lot in the next eight years. Jesus can fix that. Jesus is the answer. We'll never find the answer that will bring lasting peace in politicians, our laws, the answer is Jesus and the laws that he writes on our hearts. You can't write a law in Washington and make all people obey it and believe it and accept it. But Jesus can come and write his laws on our hearts that we should love one another as we love, that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And that can, and that can happen. Not only does he make us alive again, but he fills us with the power for success. He empowers us. We need spiritual empowerment to combat the devil's attacks. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I want you to know that Satan never rests. He's always out there. I know there's, maybe, there may be people listening today on the internet who would say, I don't even believe in Satan. <laughs> How? You know, they don't make no difference. But just because you don't believe, don't make it true. God's word says that he's a, a real person, not maybe person, but he, he is a real being. And he really exists. And he's really our enemy. And he really wants to destroy us. If there was ever a time when we could hear Satan's roars, it's right now. I read an article that said that the, on the African Serengeti, the male lions will roar several times during the night. That they'll be asleep 
And they'll wake up and they'll lash out with this roar that just sends fear to all other animals. They're not hunting. They just go back to sleep. But just every so often, they wake up and roar. And the experts said that they do this because they want their prey to always be on edge and in fear of the darkness. That's what Satan wants. He wants us to always live on edge, not experiencing the peace of God and being afraid of what might be out there. And that's not the message of Jesus. We can know his peace and as the song said, God reigns, he's in control, and we can trust him. Satan is doing the same thing to us. He roars and he, he does want us to experience God's peace everywhere you turn, no matter what your position is, or no matter what you hold in life to be true, Satan is roaring loud and long. You know, as conservatives and whatever and Christians, let's say as Christians we look at some of the world and we say they're trying to take away our right to worship. And, and, and that is true sometimes. And they're trying to take away our civil rights. And they're trying to take away what we hold most dear. But do, do you know what they think? They think the exact same thing about us. That we're trying to take away what they hold most dear. Now, there is a difference between right and wrong, but the message from Satan is, is that everyone is trying to get you and that you should live in fear. And Jesus says that you don't have to live in fear, that you can have the peace that transcends all understanding. Amen? It's not just something that Paul, it, it sounds good to say, the peace that transcends all understanding. <laughs> That's a good phrase. I wish I would have coined it. But it's not just an ideal yet. It's not just something that sounds good. It's something that's real, that we can grab hold on, that we can experience, that we can have in our lives. But only as we give Jesus control of the boat or our lives. And I want you to know, even God's people can be intimidated by Satan's roars. Just look at the disciples. They knew Jesus better than anyone, and the Bible says that they were afraid. Terrifying, hiding behind locked doors. Right now the lions are roaring. Do, do you hear them? They're out there, they're roaring. Are you listening to the roars of Satan? Or do you hear the lion and the tribe of Judah? He's, he has a message. A message of peace and love and unity. It's your choice who you listen to. Who do you hear the loudest? Who do you follow? The roars of Satan or the words of the Savior which bring peace and everlasting life. Satan is out to intimidate us, to divide us, and to conquer us by attacking our faith. But the Lion of the tribe of Judah brings peace in the midst of the storm, a peace which transcends all understanding. Paul says you can't even understand it. I, I'm not going to try to explain it to you. You just can't. I just can't. He says it will guard your heart and your minds. There's two places where you get scared. You get scared in your mind when you start thinking what might be out there. You know, Winston Churchill said there's nothing to fear but fear itself. Because fear is an emotion. It's something that's unreal. It's caused by the situations in our life. But it's not, you can't reach out and grab a handful of fear. You can't throw it in the trash can and say, I don't want you no more. It's something that we, it's an emotion that we have to deal with. And that we can overcome it. And that we can have victory over it. And Jesus gives us that victory. We can trust in Jesus. He's always been there for us. He's never let me down. Or do I know anyone who has ever said, Christ has let me down? Not anyone who truly knew him. There seems to be, our, our world seems to be filled with this hatred and anger. But Jesus is in complete control. I want you to know that Jesus is not overwhelmed by the storms of life. 
And he is not bothered by the state of the union or the economy or anything else that we're going through. Jesus is in complete control. He wrote the book. He knows how it ends. He's told us how it ends. And he says, you can be at peace. He has won the battle, and we can have the peace that transcends all understanding because of that. My brothers and sisters, we, we, when we focus on the division instead of what Christ gives us, which is his love, then we'll always be divided. We will never be the world that Christ wants us to be. And truly, until Christ comes, we'll never be 100% what he wants us to be. But we can be and live the way he wants us to live right today, right now. We can live loving others. We can live in peace. We don't have to have a spirit of fear. Over and over in the Old Testament, God told the Israelites, be strong and courageous because I am with you. And he wasn't with them at the way Jesus is with us. God was with them, but he didn't live inside them. Jesus actually lives inside of us. His spirit is with us to strengthen us and to empower us and to give us that sound mind that he, he in his word gives us. God is looking for someone to take his message to the world. Jesus said in Mark 4, 21, and again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus knew that one of the things that we need is a mission. I firmly believe that people need a mission. They need to be working on something. They need to be doing something. Just sitting at home all the time, people just waste away. Their talents waste away. Their gifts waste, waste away. And we really accomplish nothing. Jesus says, I have a mission for you. He says, the Father sent me, and now I'm sending you. God is looking for someone to take his message to the world. In Isaiah 6, the Lord asked, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Jesus asked that same question to everyone who accepts him as Savior. Who shall I send and who will go? I want you to know that the Lord has chosen you to deliver his message. He has a mission for you to focus on. When you're focused on that mission, that helps you to leave the fear and division behind. I want you to know that the Lord has chosen you. There's a lot of scared people out there who need the peace of Christ. Will you be like Isaiah and respond to the Lord and say, Lord, send me, I'll go, I'll do what you want, I'll stand on your word? Isaiah wanted to be that kind of man. He wanted to be a man of God. He wanted to do things the Lord's way. My, may I say that the greatest need in the church today is people who will stand on the Lord's word. Everywhere in society, we are being told that God's word doesn't count. You, you need to be politically correct. And if you're not, you're attacked. Think of the stories. I don't know if you read much on the internet. I especially have read more on the internet lately. And anytime people speak their mind, if, they're, if it's not politically correct, they're attacked by the liberals and the press. Oh, how can you say that? Well, it just happens sometimes to be the truth. It's all right for some people to believe what they want, but it's not all right for us to believe what we want. It's not all right for us to believe that the Bible is right, but what the world needs, what America needs now is people who will stand up for God's word. No, that's wrong. No, that's wrong. You know what I'm saying? Are you following me? There's sin out there in our world that we've legalized in America. Abortion. That is probably the main, one of the main things I can think of. America calls it legal. We've been fighting a battle for the last 30 or 40 years trying to make it, trying to keep it legal or trying to unlegalize it. The, the Christians say no, the liberals or whoever say yes. 
It, it's a woman's choice, or is it God's choice? Is it what God says, or is it a woman's body for her to do with what she wants? Some things are wrong. If they're wrong, we need to stand up and call them. And I want to tell you something, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Because if you stand up for God, there's going to be people in the world who will attack you for it. Amen? Amen? It's true. I don't know how many times lately I've seen people say something, you know, on Twitter. I don't say anything on Twitter. I don't even have a Twitter. I don't even know how you Twitter. But I don't say anything on those things. I do my speaking up here, but I want to tell you something. I've seen in the news over and over where people say something and the next day they apologize. Oh, I didn't mean it to sound so politically incorrect. I, I, I didn't mean it to sound like that. Well, if you say it, stand by it. Amen? If it's wrong, it's wrong. If you're standing on God's word, you know you're standing on a firm foundation. Amen? Now, if you're just standing on your feelings, maybe you don't want to say anything on Twitter. But if you're standing on God's word, then you should feel free to speak your peace. But just know that it may not be popular. We must have conviction. We must be convicted about the cause and be convicted to action. One of the things that I've seen happen in the world since the 1960s is that Christians live in the peace that God has given them and they don't stand up for their rights. I know there was a lot of uproar when Roe versus Wade was passed. But if all the Christians in our country would have marched on Washington, it would be overturned by now. We wouldn't live with this over our heads. TV and the media have gone so far that you can't even watch a show on TV anymore. In 1950, you know, Lucy and Ricky slept in different beds and they were covered from head to toe. Now, anything goes. Anything goes. And you never heard a cuss word on TV in the 60s. Maybe a little bit. Now, there's no word that they don't use on TV. There's nothing that's out of bounds. There's nothing that little children shouldn't hear. Everything goes. We can't stymie anybody's rights because everything goes. If it feels good, do it. And that's not the message of God. And we need people who will stand up and say, no, that's not the way it is. I know I shouldn't go down this aisle, this rabbit hole, but... I don't know, in the 80s, I worked with a man who was a Christian, and, he, and I was a Christian, and we worked together. And uh, there was a presidential election. I don't remember who was running, but he asked me, who are you going to vote for? And y'all should know, you never ask anybody who, who, who you're going to vote for, right? <laughs> but um, like, you don't talk about politics. And I told him who I was going to vote for, and he told me, how can you vote for him? And I said, well, he's... He stands for the things that I stand for. And he said, well, what are they? And I said, well, mainly he's against abortion. And we got to talk to him. And he told me, he said, well, I'm a Christian, and I don't believe in abortion, but I'm going to vote for the other guy. And I said, that's fine. That's, that's your right. I said, I, I won't vote for somebody who wants to commit murder against babies. The next day, he came, we, he, we came to work. Election was over. It wasn't important who won. But he came to me and he told me, he said, you know what? I was standing in line last night, and what you said kept going around in my heart and in my mind. And he said, I voted for life, 
and against abortion. You see, when we stand up for what we believe in, we invite people to the truth of God's word. Amen? And if we don't do that, they may never hurt. I don't know what church he went to. I don't know what denomination he was. I just know that he was a misinformed Christian. Now, you can vote for whoever you want. I would never try to tell you who to vote for. But we need to vote for Jesus. Amen? We need to stand on his word. That's the way peace comes. I'll try to hurry up and bring this to an end. We need to stay the course. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. God wants us to let people know that, that those who will seek God, he will be found. For those who will turn from the world's ways of doing things to his way of doing things, their sins will be forgiven. And as a nation, if we will do that, then our land can be healed. I'm a witness to Jesus that Jesus can bring peace and forgiveness into your life. And you're all witnesses to that. God turned my life around and filled it with peace. It's been over 2,000 years since Jesus spoke the words of peace in that storm and changed the disciples' worlds forever. But I'm thankful that 2,000 years later, Jesus is still able to calm the storms and bring peace to our lives. Amen? Jesus says, peace be still, and the storms must obey the Creator. But Jesus gives us a choice. Who will we follow? The storms have to obey Christ. Everything has to obey Christ, but he gives people a choice. Who will we follow? I want to point out that the greatest miracle in this story is what happened to change the disciples' lives. The way they saw Jesus different after this. And I'm talking about the first story. It says the disciples feared the storm. They were in the boat. The lightning was flashing. The thunder was rolling. And they feared. They said, Jesus, teacher, rabbi, don't you care that we're going to drown? The word says that they were terrified. They were scared of the Romans. They were scared of the Jews. They might be crucified. But Mark 4.41 says they, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? They, they were scared of the ocean and the storm. And they, they were scared of other things. But when they saw Jesus in his power, they said, what kind of guy is this? What manner of man is he that when he commands even the winds and the waves obey him? Jesus is in control of all worlds. The disciples were experienced fishermen. They knew that the waves just don't die down because the storm is over. I want you to know I was in a hurricane on an aircraft carrier, and when the winds quit blowing, the waves quit kept rolling for almost a week. In fact, during the whole hurricane, I never got sick. That was after the hurricane had left that I got seasick. It was the only time I had ever gotten seasick because the rains just kept on rolling. They just kept coming in one after another. I said, what manner of man is this? I will tell you, Jesus is the great peacemaker and peace giver. If you need peace in your life, then you need to give control of your life to Jesus. Amen? And you know what? It's not just something we do one time. We don't come to the altar one time and say, Jesus, I'm giving everything to you. It's yours from now on. We do that, but later on we, we say, well, <laughs> I might need to take this back. or I, I can't take that back. Or maybe something comes along that we didn't even know bothered us. And we're scared to death of it. There's a new storm, a new threat. 
And we need to give that to Jesus. What manner of man like, like this? Jesus, Pilate, it's the boat. Jesus piloted their boat right into a deadly storm. Jesus knew what was going to happen that night. He says, let's get in the boat and go across. And they went right into the storm. I want to tell you something. When you trust Jesus to pilot your boat, he will lead you into the storms. You're going to go into the storms of life. And if you don't trust Jesus, you're going to find yourself in the storms of life. The only difference is, is some people are out in the boat and they don't have Jesus. And some people are out there in the boat and they have the peace that transcends all understanding. Amen? They had to be willing to follow Jesus to see him in all of his power and glory. You know, I don't know how many people didn't get in the boat that night. I know all of us disciples probably did. And I know that there were people in the other smaller boats that followed. Because it says that earlier in the story. It said that there were other people in smaller boats. And what does that tell us real quick? That when you're in the storm and you think you're out there all by yourself. And the things couldn't get no worse. There's other people in the storm with you. And they're even in smaller boats than you are. And believe me, when you're out on the ocean in a big storm, the size of the boat makes all the difference. They too had to follow Jesus. If, if you want to experience all of God's love and all of God's peace and all of God's glory, then you have to be willing to follow him wherever he leads. And he will lead you into the storm. Oh, what storms he will lead us through so that we, that we may experience his love. You see, when you've got Jesus in the boat with you, you experience his love and provision. And when Jesus isn't in the boat, you're all by yourself. Even though he leads us into the storm, when the last temptation has passed, and the last shot in our life, in our battle, has been fired, we will be able to say, Jesus was with me every step of the way. I really happen to believe that when David wrote Psalms 23, that's exactly what he was thinking when he wrote verse 4. four Yea, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David knew what it was like to walk in the valley of shadow of death. And he says, Jesus was with me every step of the way. Jesus is saying, do not fear, my child. I will lead you through the storm, but I will walk with you and sail with you through the storm. And I will comfort you so that you can learn to love and experience me fully. I don't know. We need to stand on God's word. And we need to pray. And we need to give God complete control of our lives. Wherever we're at, whatever situation we're in. I've asked LaDonna to come and lead us in a song. I don't know if you've ever heard it. It's called uh, Jesus Savior, Pilot Me. I love that old hymn. It says, Jesus Savior, Pilot Me, over life's tempest of seas, unknown waves before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous soul, chart and compass come from thee. Jesus, Pilot Me. We need to let Jesus pilot our boats and trust him during this time. Amen? Then one leaves. 
close us in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do ask for your peace in our hearts this week, for, our peace, in our, for peace in our families this week, for peace in our nation this week, Lord Jesus. While it consumes our days and the news and maybe even our anxieties, uh, we've been here before in this country. We've been here before around the world. It will happen again. So Jesus, we've overcome, and we just trust that you will guide us to overcome again. Lord, you're in control, and we place all of these anxieties, all this unrest, all of the rioting and the political correctness at your feet, and pray, Lord God, that you would just continue to guide us to do what we should do, to say what we should say, and to stand on your word as you ask us to. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you this morning. We pray for your peace and guidance this week in all that we do. And we give you thanks and ask this in precious name. Amen. You are dismissed.